I'll keep uh, keep my introductory spiel short and sweet here, or short anyway. Um, as as Martin said uh, at the beginning, there's been uh, for a long time how live music uh, fitted into the research picture, fitted into the uh, the industry picture was, was kind of missing from academia. Um, increasingly addressed over the last few years. Uh, but we have also seen a plethora of reports uh, gathering pace over the last decade or so uh, to try and enumerate uh, the sector or sectors uh, in in some ways. Um, and that's partly what, what this 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 panel and this day is about is, is to try and get get to grips with how we do that uh, and why we do that. Um, so here we're going to look at different ways of uh, valuing live music. Uh, I'm delighted to have with me uh, Dr. Matt Brennan, uh, Edinburgh University, uh, Dave Lang, whose affiliation uh, is blank here. He, he's pointed out to me that that he could he could still be. Uh, listed under the University of Liverpool, I should say that the reason the, the affiliation is blank is because actually there are so many that they actually just wouldn't fit on the card. So I just I just thought I'd, I'd leave it uh, as, as that. Uh, Jonathan Todd uh, from BOP Consulting and UK Music and Marie Nixon, uh, now Chief Executive of uh, Sunderland University Students' Union. Uh, but if I could just uh, go through... Uh, through the panel and get people to introduce themselves briefly and say a few words about you know what what their their work is now and uh, again as before you know what what brought them here uh, to be to be doing that work. So Matt, great. Um, so is this on? Okay, there we are. Uh, yeah, my name is Matt. I work in the uh, music school at Edinburgh Uni, and I am. Uh, I work in the area of sort of sociology of music and popular music studies, and I came to be involved, I guess, in the live music ex exchange, as Martin was saying at the, um, in his introduction this morning, on a project looking at the history of, of British live music uh, from World War II to the present, and I was, I had the really lucky job of basically reading every issue of Melody Maker from 1950 to 1980 something and then interviewing all sorts of concert promoters and agents who back in 2008 uh, you know we now think of uh, the sort of discourse of the music industries as being something where live music is held very much in balance with the with the recording industry that the two are you know depending on who you ask one is leading the other uh, or in terms of revenue uh, in terms of how um, you know, musicians at, at various levels are, are, are making a living out of music. Um, but, but back when that project started, concert promoters and agents, even the most significant ones in the UK, seemed to be so surprised to be even asked for an interview talking about their career that they were only too happy to kind of say, oh yeah, well, of course I, you know, I booked Hendrix and Pink Floyd, let me tell you all about it for four hours, you know, and, um, and uh, so it was a really great uh, project to be involved in. And I guess after that, uh, I sort of started working more with, uh, with Martin and, and then Adam Baer on a couple of projects around the cultural value of, of live music, and uh, we can talk a little bit more about that later. Yeah. Uh, Dave? Um, well, I have to say, having heard about the average age of the folk and jazz audiences, I think I'm just about part of that. So uh, nowadays, I'm... <coughs> Semi, semi retired, but in the past, I think I can describe my career as being a kind of having been a crossbreed between, on the one hand, academic teaching and research from the earliest day, or early days of uh, popular music education, although not quite as early as the, the course at Salford that Matt was talking about, and um, a career in music journalism and particularly music business journalism, which gave me quite, I hope, quite a lot of insight into um, 
the wondrous ways of the music industries. And I'm, in specifically, as far as our topic today is concerned, in 1996, I was one of the authors of a... This is the executive summary, not the whole report, by the way, of a thing called The Value of Music, um, which uh, was, I think, the first um, attempt to uh, map was the word they used to use then, the, the music industry in the context of the growing uh, concept of the cultural industries and the creative industries. Uh, and since then, um, since that point, there were very, I've undertaken research with different colleagues for the, for the Musicians' Union, for uh, Jazz Services, an interesting organisation which um, well, interesting to me, but which um, uh, has now um, faded out, and various other um, organisations in, in Europe as well as uh, in the UK. So I'm kind of a, nowadays I'm kind of more of a, an observer for on, on the sidelines of what's going on. But my comments today hopefully will be based on that background and that experience. Okay, thank you. And Jonathan, do, doing that research on, on the value of live music right now, so picking that up. Literally doing it on the train on the way here. Um, yeah, I'm not a musician, I'm not a music industry person. Um, I'm a music fan, but it's a long time since I read uh, The Melody Maker. Not, not, not read any issues from the 1960s. Um, I'm a dismal scientist, so I'm an economist. Um, over a decade, I've been an economic consultant. Um, so, uh, BOP Consulting, I work with now, I have a lot of uh, expertise in cultural value, but my personal expertise is much more narrowly economic. Um, for the past three or four years, I've been working with uh, UK Music, uh, two annual studies measuring music, which looks at the GVA export and employment contribution of the music industry as a whole. And I've left some copies of uh, Wish You Were Here at the back, which looks at live music and music tourism, people, the economic impact of people traveling both internationally and uh, more than three times the average commuting distance in the UK to go to gigs and festivals. Um, so I've moved over the past decade from being a kind of generalist microeconomic consultant to uh, specializing in the, the economics of music and also through BOP the economics of culture and creativity more broadly. Uh, thanks. And Marie, you've, you've got a, a, a broad background as a musician, the Arts Council, and, and now uh, Students' Union. I wonder if you could yeah. talk us All through so, that. So, bit. hello. Yeah. Thanks for yeah. asking me to be part of this, by the way. Um, it's very exciting. I don't do this sort of thing, so it's a bit of a thrill for me. Um, my name is Marie Nixon, and my background is uh, within the creative industries, I think is the technical term. Uh, so, I started as a musician uh, in 1994. Uh, as a teenager with uh, a band called Kinnicky, which I started with my pals coming out of our GCSEs because we wanted a project uh, to stay together and to make sure that we retained our friendship and music was the thing that we really, really loved and live, mu live music was the most exciting and also easiest expression of that love because it's the, it's the quickest and easiest thing to do to pick up a guitar, write a song and sing it. Um, so that's where I started. I moved from that to uh, lots of different jobs in the commercial music industry, starting in the post-Britpop heyday of money fights and who would like to be issued with uh, a luxury bus and roadie and what do you need next? Um, and saw that really, really change um, with the music industry really struggling to get its head around digital and its different place in uh, in people's cultural and creative lives, I suppose, with increasing competition and people just doing different things and music making up a smaller part of their identity. Um, so after that, I moved to a role at Arts Council England, where I worked across the whole of the north of England. And as you know, Arts Council England is the funder and development agency for the arts and culture across England. <laughs> um, and really different pushes and pulls on uh, cultural value I, I, uh, experience there. I suppose my first few weeks were a real, a real culture shock. Um, I'm very much thinking about um, value more in terms of um, 
artist development, vibrancy of place, vibrancy of fitting into a bigger, a bigger scene, I suppose, rather than um, the more commercial metrics that we would use in the music industry. Um, and in a bit of a career left turn, now I'm the chief executive of the um, University of Sunderland Students' Union which is a broad and rich role. It's really interesting to see how much uh, the role of students' unions came up on the previous panel, so I'll be really happy to explore that. Um, it's very different uh, from the, what, what you were describing there. Um, student unions are much more professionalised, but we can go into that a little bit more and the kind of what that accursed word might mean. Um, but as part of that role now, I'm really involved in Sunderland's bid to be City of Culture 2021, and that bid's been really led um, through the University, the City Council and the MAC Trust, which is an organisation I'm a trustee of. And we're presently raising capital to try and, try and build a music performance space in the city as well. OK, thanks. It's interesting that student unions are becoming more professionalised. I mean, the, the, the live music history that uh, Matt and Simon and Martin worked on, obviously the, the, there's a central role for the students' union in live music. Interesting that they're becoming more professionalised. Presumably, uh, like universities in general, they're becoming more about metrics uh, as well. Um, but obviously the value of, of, of music, there's more than one way to, to cut that. Um, reaches beyond the practitioners. So, uh, Jonathan, you talked about music tourism. Certainly uh, tourism, music is increasingly seen as a sort of a branding exercise for cities. There's a growth internationally in, in music cities, inverted commas. Um, but presumably at, at city level, they're, they're thinking quite heavily about economics, GVA, hotel bed nights, and so forth. What, what exactly are we measuring uh, here? And, and who sets the parameters of that? How does that work with, between BOP and UK music? Um, I think the measuring music study, the point of yeah. the measuring music study was if you ask the government what's the value of music because of the problems of the standard <coughs> industrial classification codes, they can't give a very good answer. So the point of that study was always just to look at the direct uh, GVA export and employment contribution of the <coughs> music industry and we'd include within that venues, promoters, ticket agents, you know, that kind of core uh, live music infrastructure. Um, in, in Wish You Were Here, it looks a little bit more broadly. It, you know, it looks at spending of um, music tourists, um, both at the venue and in the course of their, their, their trip to the venue or the festival. So that's bringing in things like transport, uh, accommodation, food and beverage. And um, you know, I won't rehearse the figures here, but the, you know, it does come to some very uh, substantial numbers and we work with Oxford Economics in that study so it's been a you know it's been a big undertaking. Um, both UK music studies measuring music with you here have been predominantly uh, less so with which you here but predominantly kind of UK wide studies. I think something that is there, an there is an increasing interest in and in which I think your question speaks to is um, more localized data. So we're hopeful of the next iteration of Wish You Were Here. Previously, we've published regional, regional and Scotland, Scottish and Welsh and Northern Irish figures. We will have um, a series of city breakouts. Um, one is going to be for Coventry, one of your, your rivals in the, the City of Culture bid. Um, that one as late as you like. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep them hanging out. Uh, the arena does help. Um, <laughs> of the numbers. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think, I think there's, 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 there is a research interest and kind of a uh, you know, political interest in more localised figures, which I think is, is, is connected to the kind of, um, you know, the nascent development of music cities. Yeah. Uh, oh, one of the, the interesting things, you know, we try to do some of uh, the live music exchange um, similar research or like a mapping I guess we call it a census in Edinburgh. Um, and the difficulty is, what do you count? What is, you know, from, from stadiums right down to a cafe? And I, I mean, Dave, when you were doing, you know, your research, uh, there's this sense of the core music industry. Did you, how, how did you define that back in the, or how has that changed since you've been? Well, I mean, I think, yeah. I think there's a lot more, um, information being provided 
but from within the live music industry as, than there was um, back in the day. I mean, back in, I don't want to go back into the history very much, but you know, the, the best uh, s source of internal source of uh, information in those days was the Association of British Orchestras. I'm not even sure whether the Concert Promoters Association existed then. So we were scratching around to, um, uh, to get the information. But I think one of, one of the issues about, uh, that one has to be careful about in, in defining the limits of an industry is the, uh, is the wish sometimes for the researchers and members of the industry to kind of uh, spread it, to, to, to go further than perhaps is realistic or, or uh, is suitable so that to, to kind of uh, gather in a lot more uh, areas of activity than perhaps um, are very specific to that industry. I mean, one of the things about live <coughs> music, for instance, is it, it, it's also part of two bigger industries. On one side, there's the broader music industry, and I know we kind of know, we're, we're kind of in an era when we contrast the live music industry with the record industry and say, oh, the those big record companies have, have got what they deserved and you know they're not providing any money anymore but there, there is still a, there's still part of the ecology to use that word there's still an, an ecology of that and, in, and indeed the publishing industry and we've heard about PRS's uh, role in in live music as well as taking money out of live music for uh, royalties for composers putting it back and on the other side I mean live music a lot of the skills of uh, people who work in live music, not the musicians, obviously, are, are those of event, the events industry generally, and indeed the performing arts industries generally. So I think we, we have to kind of be aware that uh, it, it's an industry that, that has those, uh, those other links as well. But certainly, in, uh, just to, to come back, I mean, you, you know, nowadays there is, is much better uh, informa information sources and one of the things that has happened is the live music industry was the last sector of or, or the music industry or the music industries to actually see the importance of, of organisation, you know the promoters finally saw that as well as fighting each other they should actually they have, they have, they have common issues and common problems so that you know the the, the festival organisations and the promoters' organisations and the music venues trust and so on are all very um, positive developments in this. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm glad you mentioned ecology. Obviously, that that idea of interdependence between different sizes of venue, different um, different types of promoter is key. But I, I also think that there's there's another area that live music massively o overlaps with. Uh, in terms of its economics, in terms of business model, that's the licensed trade uh, and pubs, bars, uh, you know, from tea in the park uh, downwards. Um, but a lot of these grass, a lot of grassroots live music starts and, and thrives or struggles uh, in places that, that are in that grey area between being a music venue, not being a music venue, uh, being a pub. Um, as you say, with the Music Venues Trust, they seem to have developed a more cohesive voice. Um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, Matt, you, uh, obviously UK Music have done some work with the Music Venues Trust, uh, so has, has Live Music Exchange. But Matt, you've got experience of, of kind of working, researching these spaces, also playing in them. What do you think the sort of the prognosis for them? There's a, a narrative that they're under threat. Yeah. Is that...? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the narrative exists, you know, it's it's coming out of a reality for for small music venues. Uh, you know, when you say that I've been doing some of this research, I should say, you know, you've been doing a lot of this research. Uh, you know, we've been working as, as part of a, uh, a team, and, and Adam has been the one on the ground who's been um, out, for yeah, instance. But I'm the chair, so you have to answer the question. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> so let me pose a question to you. Um, no, I'm not, I won't do that. Um, you know, small small music venues are a crucial part of 
uh, what you would call this this larger ecology, which what you might have ten years ago called a you know a cluster or uh, or or sector or Seven quarter. <clears throat> exactly. Yeah. You know, I think the fact that that ecology has become become a kind of buzzword. Uh, it, itself, in terms of describing this, you know, this network of of venues, what makes it, a, a, you know, a, a city healthy musically? Uh, the notion of a, an ecology, the reason why that has come into parlance and worked so well, is partly I because I think it conveys immediately to policymakers uh, this notion of interdependence. On the one hand, you know, you were saying, uh, Jonathan, that you know, an arena helps with the numbers, you know, and of course it does. But arenas also depend on training grounds, you know, for acts to to fill those arenas in in ten years' time. Otherwise, those numbers are not going to be looking so great, right? Um, so, uh, it's they're they're important in the fabric, but they're but they're uh, but in terms of numerics, they're sometimes difficult to 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 demonstrate that to policymakers. Which hence the importance of a of a census. Uh, to kind of demonstrate that, and of course, when you also have these big infrastructural projects, which are very attractive to to local authorities, like an arena, um, part of the strategy behind that is you know uh, to regenerate a neighborhood. But that, of course, leads to property development, um, you know, uh, new flats moving in just above venues. These these threats you see happening um, across cities in the UK, and and they're not imaginary. Uh, but in terms of the prognosis um, that you were asking about, there does also, you know, appear to be a, an opportunity for cautious optimism, I guess. Uh, I, for instance, we've worked on a couple of projects on the cultural value of live music. If you had told me, you know, two years ago when we were working on these things that, uh, that in 2016 we'd be meeting regularly with Edinburgh City Council, for instance, and we'd be talking to them about how Scottish government are being lobbied for agent of change principle. If you had told me that I had gone, you know, that I would go to uh, a round table that happened a, a few weeks ago in the run up to, to local elections and Scottish parliamentary elections, and every representative from every political party, uh, you know, all, you know, if they didn't understand the term agent of change, they at least mouthed it and mouthed support for it, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's on people's lips. You have the Music Venue Trust, which is this kind of collective uh, voice for smaller venues, which did not exist you know, three years ago. Uh, you have the London Live Music Task Force, uh, who published a rescue plan. Interestingly, when I tried to access that online uh, just yesterday, 404 does not exist. You can't, you can't find said report anymore. Um, so I'd like to yeah, locate a copy. Um, Soon, um, but there are you know there are some there's there's some cause to to think that actually this is something which at a level of government is you know being recognized as a a problem and something that they're that they're trying to to respond to and develop a strategy towards. Who knows you know where we'll be in another year's time, but at the moment you know it seems like it's getting some traction. Yeah, I think part of that though. I mean, we wrote this thing on cultural value, getting beyond the numbers. Copies available on the table and, of course, at our website. But in making that case to, to local councils and, and to cities, I mean, certainly, you know, our experience from Edinburgh, the city council was, oh, this, that's very interesting. And then you give them the report that's, you know, nice, thick, juicy report with loads of footnotes. And uh, they say, oh, that's very interesting. How many millions is it? And then when they, you know, when they read that figure, the culture committee's eyes light up because they say, "Oh, okay, great. We can take this to to the planning council. We, you know, we can uh, we can make the case." So they still kind of depend on the numbers for that case. Mm. And then there's that sort of methodological issue of how you get the numbers. You know, what you include. And, and we we found it. You know, it was challenging to to do the census in Edinburgh. And I know that um, UK Music were involved with one in in Bristol. I wonder if the, if there was sort of Similar, what, what what the kind of challenges might be now, or, or how you, um, you know, what what was more important there? Was it was it the figures for the? Um, 
I think they're definitely, you know, we discussed it at the time, I think there definitely were challenges in terms of the, the long tail of, uh, of live music venues and um, you know, they, are, they are contributing a lot and I certainly you know, fully recognise uh, Matt's point about interdependency and you, know, you need to start out on the, at the smaller venues before you, you get, to the, get to the bigger venues. I don't think... Um, I'm not aware. I might, might be wrong, but I, 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 I think that's a kind of that's definitely true. But I, I don't see any kind of numbers that I think it'd be interesting to kind of try to, you know, to, 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 to give some quantification to the um, to the interdependence argument. Um, something I have I've done myself is run a regression on um, the age of um, headliners at um, uh, major UK festivals. And somebody else, by strange coincidence, did the same thing, and uh, it was in The Economist. And we both came to the same observation that headliners definitely are getting older, which a little bit like interdependency is a kind of truism that we all know. And I think there's two ways of interpreting that. One is a, a kind of demand-led argument, but that's just what customers want. Uh, people going to fe the, the, the audience going to festivals is getting older, at least large festivals and they uh, have more of a demand for older acts. Or, uh, more negatively, is a supply side argument which would say that the kind of um, the supply of acts from smaller venues and up through the, the, uh, the system, as it were, um, is not as, um, it's not as strong as it, as it once was. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting point, and it, it, it speaks to, to questions that were raised on on the previous panel about kind of retaining audiences and retaining, you know, bringing younger musicians through. Um, but obviously it's, it's, the numbers are important in terms of making the case for live music, but, but other, other criteria are applied as well. I mean, Marie, you, you know, you've obviously played a load of venues, you've worked with them, you work, <coughs> work with the Arts Council. What kind of, we talk about cultural value and people just assume oh, cultural value, yeah, we, you know, we know what that means, but what kind of criteria beyond, you know, how, how, many, is, how many bums on seats is this going to put or, or how many people are we going to get through the door, uh, do you think about at, at Sunderland or, or, or kind of came into play at the Arts Council? Well, I think there are different pushes and pulls depending on which role I've been in. I've probably yeah. experienced it quite differently in every one. It's interesting because I'm thinking about what you're saying about interdependencies there and kind of a pipeline of talent from small venue to mid-scale tour into arena to mm. festival headliner. Um, and at one point, particularly when I worked in the commercial and music industry, like that was absolutely true. I saw it. I get it. Um, and I think those small scale, small scale venues then were being to a degree subsidised by the private sector. So we would get significant amounts of tour support to get our emerging artists to play the Doncaster Leopard. It was the only way, basically, that we could get them there. Um, and other venues of that type. I would say now, and I suppose particularly thinking about, uh, I'm trying to book freshers. I'm trying to think about who our artists will be for freshers. And it would appear, when you look at the types of artists that are available and that would have appeal, that actually um, the music industry is suffering and TV has been much cleverer. So the way that telly has adapted to the threat of digital and created opportunities for appointment to view television, created opportunities for people to come together and watch the telly at the same time, usually through live music, has meant that that is the pipeline of talent. Those are the acts that I can book for freshers. Those are the acts that you can see at the arena. The most successful end being Little Mix. Um, you know, the kind of the lower end being, you know, the sort of thing that you will see around the kind of mid-scale touring circuit. So I would, from my direct experience, I would challenge the notion that that, that talent pipeline is, is there from kind of a traditional maybe indie band, next Coldplay, next U2, next kind of Glastonbury headliner, that doesn't really seem to be there. So the value that I look at now and the value that we think about in this particular role, the metrics are financial, the metrics are about that, but actually, on the other hand, the real challenge to that is the point of freshers and that type of thing is that we're looking to create opportunities for our students, our members to meet, come together, make connections and have meaningful experiences. And obviously, depending on what you book, the term, what you program, there's going to be more or less likelihood 
of that happening. So it's quite a complex set of things we think about now. At the Arts Council at the time, I was there very much, um, as Chris was saying, in the legacy of Culture 10, um, a lot of money for festivals um, kicking around. And we think about placemaking and we think about uh, ecology and vibrancy of the, of particularly of the region at that point. So there would be metrics around uh, bums on seats and, um, you know, would, would this, actually we thought a lot about would this activity die with the festival, you know, actually there should be some kind of um, longer lasting impact of this particular type of work taking place. Um, but in the commercial music industry, live music was quite interesting, depending on the artist I was working with. So if it was indie groups or like rock acts, then they'd very much see it as, um, well, they wouldn't see it this way, but we'd think about it in terms of customer acquisition, building a fan base, and that's why you'd support it, because there wasn't any money in it. Towards the end, it'd be very much about, with the introduction of kind of 360 deals and the kind of Robbie Williams approach of the majors would sign them for their records, but also for their touring, for their merchandise, for all these weird other income streams that they could they could think of. Then live music became the value of it became commercial, and you know that's one of the ways in which we'll keep these bands and artists going. Um, it's quite a change picture. But interestingly, with when you're working with pop acts, live music, the value for them was about proving their authenticity, proving that they were musicians and that they could do it and they could do a gig, and and people would have all of the same emotions, feelings, connections, you know, their, their gig was a real, was a real gig. Um, yeah, sort of a long answer to that question, but quite different depending on which role I've been in at the time. And I suppose personally for me, when I was a musician in Kinnicky, um, I'm still a musician, but at that time as kind of a teenager, I kind of used that band and that music to create, to create an in-group from a natural group of outsiders and then use the live experience to um, to expand that and create that gang, and everywhere we went, you know, our shows would be quite participatory, and people would dress like us, and it became about more of a kind of emotional, cultural value of those of those shows, and also showing off, which I really enjoy, yeah. which is not to be underestimated. <laughs> yeah, I mean that that's really interesting that that sort of creating an in group, there's a, a, a sort of a value, a benefit mm -hmm. from that. Uh, and likewise, from you know a fresh, fresh as week activity, there's ben benefits from those uh, social benefits or, or cultural benefits. And I guess as the funding pot gets smaller, but more people want a piece of it. Uh, certainly, academics do this. People speak to those benefits to, to try and make make the case uh, for funding. And that, that I guess that was part of the drive. Bar behind uh, researching cultural value. Uh, but then it becomes quite diffi difficult to, to quantify that. Now, I know, I know there was um, a report from the DCMS or done by Goldsmiths, uh, or uh, Dave O'Brien, rather, uh, for the DCMS, about how other, um, other sectors, so health or the environment, have used non-economic indicators to make a case uh, but they're still trying to quantify it in some way, whether it be um, life years uh, and so forth. Is th this is this kind of eternally knotty question, though. Are we trying to kind of square this circle of, you know, intrinsic value and instrumental value, whether it be the, eco uh, the ecology or, or, or the environment that still is being instrumentalized in some way? Is is this a circle that can be squared? And you know, I guess I'll put this to Dave first. Should we even be trying to square that? Well, it, the question—I suppose it's a question of why we should want to. I mean, um, there was a report or an, a, an article a few years ago by three cultural economists, Bakshi, Freeman, and Hitchin, called "Measuring Intrinsic Value." And their subtitle was How to Stop Worrying and Love Economics. Um, <laughs> and their point was, but their, their, their target audience was um, the, the traditional, if you like, clients of arts councils, i.e. people who run org arts organisations that um, uh, rely primarily or, or mostly on... Um, public subsidy through arts councils or other trusts and so on. Um, and the, the, 
the, the argument in the paper was to, to, to try and show them that you know, we should try and quantify this for our own, or for your own good, otherwise you, you're going to lose your grants. So, it, that, I mean, that seems to me not a very relevant uh, debate for the kind of area of music we're talking about here. I think, I think um, intrinsic is, an un, is a bit of an unfortunate word because it means absolutely... Uh, literally means something that's purely internal to something and um, I'm not sure that uh, that actually uh, you can you can um, penetrate into that without uh, going into other other areas of, of the non-economic areas which are still extrinsic the ones that Adam was talking about I mean some years ago um, Sue Hallam of the Institute of Education in London did a, re a PRS sponsored it, I think, a really useful report on um, the whole whole range of uh, I think it was called the Power of Music, a whole range of um, work, re academic research that had been done on uh, mu in music therapy, uh, other areas of so-called well-being. Uh, questions of music supporting and developing um, personal identity and so on. And I think that that's an, an important area that um, I don't really see a need for it to be um, quantified, in, uh, particularly in financial terms. So I th in my view at the moment is, yes, there are attempts to square that circle, but and I'm, prob I'm not a... I'm not an advanced mathematician. Possibly that there are circles are being squared in mathematics theory. I don't know, but I'm, I'm not sure it's really necessary to do it at this stage. Um, well, Jonathan, and then I guess Matt, you, you, you know, you, you work in, you know, with metrics, but it's making a case, ultimately, I guess, for. Uh, for something larger, but how do you find those relationships work in terms of... Well, I think um, the UK music work has predominantly been about making a case yeah. to central government. Maybe there's, you know, increasingly making cases to different parts of uh, you know, devolved administrations and local government. The BOP stuff tends to be, um, you know, similarly making a case for, for some kind of uh, funding. Uh, yeah, so that, 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 that that's, that's the kind of bread and butter of my uh, daily working life. It's economics as, a, as an advocacy tool. So I think that's the reality of the world, um, for better or worse. And you know, I, I understand you know, the kind of what you're describing in terms of the Edinburgh experience and the search for a big number. Um, to answer Dave's question as why should we want to, I think we would, it, it might serve the sector well to, to have robust evidence to take into those exchanges. I let that, as much as that's, that's the way of the world, I think coming back to your thing about qu quality adjusted life years, um, quality adjusted life years are used by uh, NICE to make decisions, as, as you know, around kind of wh which drugs get, get subsidized and which drugs don't. I think um, Obamacare in America tried to introduce something similar to the US and they were derided as death panels. Um, so, um, not always popular, but I do think um, <laughs> but the, the, the core answer to Dave's question in the health context is wh why should we want to do it? It's because we've got a finite amount of money and we want to get the maximum health impact for the amount of money that we've got. In theory, we might say the same logic applies to the cultural sector, but I think the big challenge with that and uh, I've spoken to Dave O'Brien about this before, is kind of the, the, the plausibility of ever having a, a cultural value metric that could be in any way equivalent to the quality adjusted life year. And I would be slightly sceptical, but I've not read the Nesta paper you're referring to, but I think if I was going to say something really kind of dismal scientist, we, you know, I think there are tools within economics that we could do this with. Okay. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting, you know, how, you know, you know, why we do this, why we do this research. Uh, clearly, the you know the arts sectors, uh, music industries, academics, um, we lobby for 
or people lobby for money. But the other thing that people lobby for is, is I guess, changes in the way things are done, so regulation. Um, and this is maybe pointing forward to, to the sort of the, the post-lunch panel, but you know, there's increasingly there's this work being done on uh, on ticketing, touring. The uh, the previous panel mentioned that you know the problems of getting visas. Um, I guess most of what we've been talking about so far uh, fits quite neatly into a, a UK context. Um, I just wonder if, if you know. What, what the panel's experience are before I open this out to the floor in terms of how they see this. Um, it, it's very difficult to disentangle live music, whether it be touring, tourism, or ticketing from that international context. Uh, how, the, how the panel see, uh, see their own work kind of fitting into that, that broader context. I'll start with uh, Marie, thanks. I think I'm going to say a given. It's a really, it's a really hard question. Yeah. I think for, for in my present role, I'm thinking about the 2021 bid. We're acutely aware that music is an incredible strength for Sunderland. It always has been, um, but it's how we keep that on the go and how we make sure that because of that we don't just look in and say music is our thing and we're we're good at that. Um, in the process of Touchwood building this new venue in this new cultural quarter in Sunderland. It's something that we're really aware of in terms of understanding the pushes and pulls, what the demand is for the different types of creative activity and what we can reasonably expect to get as well. But uh, that aside, I think that's quite a hard question for me to answer in my okay. present role. Uh, three quick things. Uh, on behalf of UK Music, a couple of months ago, I went to a workshop at the European Commission, which was looking at... Um, <coughs> Kind of the state of evidence of our music across Europe. Um, I, you know, I think it's, it's earlier days in other parts of Europe as compared to the UK, but I think there is an appetite to improve the research. Secondly, I'm doing a kind of broadly comparable study to I uh, wish you were here in Ireland at the moment. So um, Ireland is somewhere that wants to improve its evidence base. Uh, and thirdly, I think yeah, those are kind of things that I'm up to, but. I do find with a kind of international picture, it is it's very, very, very complicated to disentangle uh, financial flows across borders and increase. You know, as the more the more digital becomes important, the harder that becomes. Yeah, actually, that last point was sort of uh, you've kind of taken the wind out of my sails. But I'll say a bit more about it. I think one of the uh, when we see these big figures about the, you know, the, the British live music industry is worth this or the turnover is that, uh, and same with the, rec the recording industry, well, what we have to remember is that a lot of the headline artists or even other artists that tour here are coming from outside the UK and uh, in, in financial terms are taking uh, money out of the UK, just like British artists uh, tour in other countries and it's always been interesting to me to look at the PRS annual figures which does show the relationship between imports and exports of if you like British music or the value of it to to other countries you know and the um, and so I think that we have to always be careful about um, what uh, claims we're making for the strength or the size or the importance of, of things that the Brits do because um, quite rightly we, we are in a very uh, international scene and um, even in the, uh, as we heard this morning, even in uh, the, the other, uh, let's say the uh, more minority or smaller minority areas of music, including jazz and folk and classical, um, there, there is a constant flow of, of musicians coming from uh, other parts of the world. And I, I'm always Im impressed, in, uh, folk is one area I know a bit about or, or read a bit about, that, that there are, you know, uh, that, pr that agents or promoters can bring in, uh, to me, fairly unknown artists from, from other countries and find, you know, find them six or ten gigs round... Um, 
around Britain, and, and, and none of them are in central London. They're, they're in uh, what we might call smaller centres quite often, where so a promoter has obviously built up a, a base for, uh, a, a, of an audience who are willing to, um, to trust that promoter with, the, with whoever they bring in, whether it's um, Americana music or some type of jazz. Thanks. I mean, Matt, we, we did some work on, on how Scotland promotes its artists abroad and, and how the, the role of the state in that. I, mean, mm -hmm. I wonder if you... Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think I, I got into research because I was interested in looking at things from a qualitative perspective, you know? So I was really excited to go into archives or to talk to people and to understand musical worlds, how they worked from from that perspective. Uh, in terms of thinking about this relationship between the local and international, what interests me most is in a way not how we measure you know, where revenue is flowing in and out, but how different cultures think about music. You know? What is the relationship between, you know, we're, uh, in, in Germany, how, how do venues relate to the state um, how do they relate to local musicians making music? How do they conceive of themselves as an industry? And, and do they do so through, uh, through methods that are, you know, qualitative, quantitative, or have this much longer legacy, you know, in terms of the, the history and ideology of, of, of a nation state or a musical culture? And I guess I'm sort of, in thinking about the relationship between the local and the international, really interested in looking to other countries to see, um, yeah, how how that works. So, you know, why do we do a census? Well, it seemed like that was an an interesting way to you know to provide provide the value of music to say a city council. Uh, that they will pay attention to, that newspapers pay attention to. You get huge amounts of coverage if you present them with these numbers. <laughs> but it's underpinned and complemented by this other understanding of music that we have, which, you know, w and there's an ideological component to, to it, but it's also, you know, it's, it's talking to, for instance, you talked to Guy Dunstan, who was, you know, the head of the National Arenas Association. You know, the fact that, you know, that he talks to other managers of marinas and is really worried about what's happening to small venues right now. You know, to me, whether you can uh, demonstrate a causality with that in numbers or not, uh, you know, that that's interesting and, and, and that matters. It's not my area of strength, but it matters to me that you know that the National Arenas Association is worried about it. You know, uh, and trying to marry that to you know to other methodologies to to create a, a an a convincing picture and seeing how other countries do that and how we might be able to do it differently. Um, not to sound like a hippie, but you know, like I, I, I feel like we've been talking about like what's the reality of the situation a little bit. Like, well, there are several realities depending on like what nation and state you're looking at, several different ways of thinking about things. And, and I want to, yeah, to learn about those. Add to that. Yeah. Just a personal reflection. Um, I think, you know, that makes me feel a bit wistful and I really miss the state in terms of how <laughs> our live music uh, scene and music in general happens. Because I'm sure if you'd done the same bit of work around the age of headliners at festivals, there's been additional work done on, on the kind of mumfidsication of successful artists and just how, you know, crushingly harsh and well off and uh, privileged a lot of the successful artists are at the moment mm. and I mean it's not too long ago that we had things like the New Deal for Musicians which you know the Arts Council is state support but it's a specific type but it's about kind of a broader look at how our country values supports and thinks about how we get the best of talent uh, and we get how we get that to the broadest audience. This new deal for musicians was maybe a slightly blunt instrument, but it was an acknowledgement that actually people of different backgrounds do bring the richness to our to our cultural scene, to our musical scene. So, yeah, that's just an observation that I really I really do miss the state in this. Can I come back yeah. on a few, a few things that yeah. Matt said uh, on your last point about that National Arenas Association? Well. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think I think you were saying Marie was saying very much the same thing. I think from my kind of statty head, uh, you know, putting some quantification on these arguments would be nice. But equally, talking to people who actually uh, are closer to the industry, I think that you know the threats that the pipeline is facing, um, you know, are, are all too evident. And, and so in that sense, we don't really need to put exact quantification on it. I think it's just, it, it's pretty clear that there, there are issues there. And secondly, more generally in terms of quantification, and I thought, I thought Matt spoke very interestingly about um, uh, relationship to the state. I think it's, you know, it's consistent with things I've talked about and also I think with your, your experience in Edinburgh, that um, communication to the state is often best in terms of quantification and what is the overall impact. Um, but that doesn't get us into the kinds of um, more um, ideological, subjective um, points that, um, that, that Matt was making. Finally, though, as much as I recognise you know, state support is not what it was, I do think the state is, remains very important. You know, we've, we've talked about agent of change, and I, I agree with Matt that I think it's been increasingly understood at relatively higher echelons, but I think that needs to be understood at, to really cut through. I think you need planning officers and licensing officers actually well, we were on, meeting on, with just yeah, a couple of weeks ago. At, yeah. Actually, yeah. actually <laughs> on the grassroots, because yeah. my, my limited experience is that they remain very unreconstructed. Totally. Yeah. And, and I think that to, you know, to be really game-changing, the message needs to move from the top right to the very bottom and the people who are making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis and they will be helped in you know persuading that that's the right way to go if the, you know more positive relationship with the state which isn't just about numbers but is also about the sense of the place and you know what it means to come from Sunderland or Birmingham or wherever it might be. Well and uh, just to add to that that the, the negative side of the relationship with the state, which shows the uh, shows the need to do the sort of thing you're talking about, was that terrible disaster of the Licensing Act 2003, which so many people in the industry spent so much time and energy and money, from including UK Music and the Musicians Union, to to mitigate the effects of it. I suppose the only positive thing is, and coming back to your point about. Uh, relationship with the the license trade is actually it did it, it did form a much closer relationship between people in the music industry and the I think was it called the beer and pub association yeah so that the, the, there was a, a kind of a, a, a formal or informal but um, conscious link built up between uh, those owners of lots of venue of, of music venues that were under threat uh, by that licensing act. Okay, thanks. Well, it's good, good to sort of finish the, the main uh, part of the panel on a positive note. Uh, I'm conscious that people will be wanting lunch soon, but we do have time for a few questions from the from the floor. If anyone. Hi. Um, this is a quick question for Matt. Um, I'm Jed, and I work for Generator, and we run a, um, a regional showcase for emerging music and some additional live events around the region. Um, for a few years now, I've been interested in um, the idea of how the Northeast culture might affect a gig-going audience, and I was interested in what you said about um, how you're curious about how different cultures think about music. Mm. Um, I've always thought wondered whether it's, a, it's just a kind of a, a population critical mass question. There's literally not just not enough people in the Northeast to get, you know, to have the amount of people that are interested in music coming to shows. But do you feel that there is a, um, something, a, a cultural mindset about people in the Northeast that, I don't know, that, that limits, limits audiences, limits an interest in going to see live music? Careful. Well, <laughs> first thing to say is, my girlfriend's from Newcastle. There's definitely a, a mindset that's, that's distinct. Uh, um, and I think that there, I, I don't, you know, I haven't looked at culture in the Northeast in any sort of like, you know, methodologically robust way. It's, it's, it's actually something that we may be doing in, in, the future at some point now that Adam is down here at Newcastle. 
Um, and uh, I do think, you know, not to comment on the Northeast in particular, I, I do think there are such things as musical cultures, like of, you know, you can have a locality which might have the same population, and one has a strong gig-going culture and the other does not. You know, two, two cities with identical populations, but there is something about uh, getting, you know, and also talking just from a point of, of audience development or, you know, having young audiences in. I think that there are some places that, uh, you know, that, that have cultures and also spaces, social spaces where people learn uh, a cultural mindset and uh, to, of, of going to shows regularly, you know? And part of that's just having spaces that have affordable shows because otherwise you are, as a young person, going to be saving your you know, money for that 200 pound ticket at a festival. You know, if you don't have a culture of, you know, and, and a set of spaces where A, you're, you're, you're learning to bond to form gangs uh, and large gangs and scenes uh, and, and it costs a fiver to do that, you know, or, or you're putting on your own shows. Uh, y you, you can just see if a place like, you know, uh, if a place like Newcastle lost the Clooney for some reason, if there was a property development, you know, that would be a blow not just from a counting perspective, but also from, you know, I, 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 I hesitate to call like the Clooney like a space for learning. <laughs> But it is, actually. It's a space for learning how to value music in a very real way. That, and you, you would notice the difference if it, if it was gone. Same with you know, a place like Leeds and the Brudenell Club. You know, the, the loss of those spaces you know, uh, really matters. And we are losing those spaces in cities across the UK. And that's kind of what's worrying to me. You know, um, just very briefly to say, I think different places do have different mindsets. But I accept that people do think differently in different places, but I do think they're very amenable to change. You know, I went to university in Durham. As soon as I get off the train here in Newcastle, it feels different from how it did 20 years ago. Birmingham now has four Michelin-starred restaurants. Who would have thought it could happen? It's a truly foodie city, and this has all happened over the past decade. So. I do think, to use a cliche, it's possible to take people on a journey. OK, thanks, Matt. I think you had a question. Yeah, one, one of the things that's just kind of follow-up point, really, because one of the things I think about live music is that um, about 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, we were routinely told that in a, a, an era of globalisation that we were kind of getting monoculture, and it didn't, doesn't matter where you live anymore in terms of opera music. I, I think that live music shows exactly that it matters very much where you live in terms of what your gig going opportunities will be. And the reasons why, why that's the case are complex, but they include such things as demographics, obviously, class composition, ethnic composition, gender composition of your local population. So, for example, when I look at somewhere like Glasgow, where, where I'm familiar, one of the reasons, picking up on Matt's point, that, that it's quite reasonably healthy is there's a lots of things, there's lots of spaces to put on music. Why is that the case? Because Glasgow had a big proletariat that it had to entertain for many years. So there's lots of spaces for, for gigs from 50 people to 50,000 people. So it's, it's, it's quite a complex question that you're, that you're asking, I think, there. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. OK, anyone wishing to comment on that? Or? Well, I think absolutely. I think I agree with what, what's been said. But I think there's also, it's not just a You've talked more in terms of supply, what I would call supply factors, but also I think there's an appetite. I don't think, you know, if the, global, the basic globalisation thesis was right, you could just drop something from Australia into Newcastle and it'd be just as popular in Newcastle as it would in Australia, but it's not like that, I think. There's, there's different demand in different places, and I think that appetite for the local in particular is, is something we increasingly see, actually, in the Wish You Were Here figures. Okay. We've probably got time for one more question. Oh, right, well, thanks very much. Uh, clearly, these are uh, complex issues. Um, and uh, clearly, uh, making the case for my, our own, my own uh, quantitative uh, and qualitative uh, activities in terms of earning a living, they involve uh, more research. You ask academics 
the, the first recommendation of, of any academic research uh, is this needs more research. Uh, clearly, that is the case here, though, um, and you know, as, as Matt said, uh, we'll be across across the UK. We'll be doing um, rolling out the live music census uh, with various partners, some of whom are in the room. And this this is a good place to start those discussions. Uh, it just reminds me to thank very much once more uh, our panelists. So thank you very much. <laughs>